Hello and welcome. So, a couple videos before this one, I responded to a video called Socialism Makes People Selfish by Dennis Prager of the YouTube channel PragerU. And this time, I'm going to respond to yet another old rich guy who says that we're greedy and selfish for not being happy little wage slaves. This man's name is Andy Puzder. My name's Andy Puzder. And he appears in a video put out by Young America's Foundation, a conservative youth organization that mainly operates on college campuses, but they also have a YouTube channel with over half a million subscribers. You might think it's weird that a video by a conservative youth organization is hosted by a 70-year-old, but maybe for conservatives, 70 is considered young. I don't know. By the way, Andy Puzder is a businessman and a multimillionaire. Surprise, surprise. And he also appears in another video by The Daily Signal, which is a conservative media organization. The two videos are extremely similar in both content and title. One is called The Inherent Greed of Socialism, and the other is called Socialism is Actually Selfish. But Andy does more than argue that socialism is selfish. He also argues that capitalism empowers the masses, that it caters to human needs and is altruistic. And it's just like, damn Andy, I hope your pants have fire insurance. In this video, I'm gonna play clips of Andy's videos so that I can respond to his arguments. But I've also put the links to both of his videos down below. That way you can watch his videos in full and see that I don't take anything out of context. Or maybe you just like to get your capitalist propaganda pure and unfiltered, the way God intended. In a capitalist economy, consumers control the economy. They vote with every dollar they spend as to whether or not your business or your venture will succeed or fail. fail. In fact, the people who, whose needs you have to meet become voters. They, they vote with every dollar they spend as to which businesses succeed and which businesses fail. So all of the power is in the hands of the masses, at the hands of consumers. It's a very consumer-based, masses-based economic philosophy. Andy is using voting power as an analogy for purchasing power. This is an analogy that many cheerleaders for capitalism love to make because they think it makes capitalism sound like a democracy. But without realizing it, this analogy actually exposes how unfair and undemocratic capitalism really is. In capitalism, it's one dollar, one vote, which might sound nice until you remember, oh right, there is a very big inequality in the distribution of those dollars. The world's 26 richest people, few enough to fit in a small classroom, own as much wealth as 3.8 billion people, half of all humanity. What kind of democracy is it when some people can cast hundreds of times more votes, thousands of times more votes, even millions and billions of times more votes than other people? It sounds like the system is rigged. Can you just imagine like, putting your humble little vote in the ballot box, and meanwhile some rich prick like Jeff Bezos just pulls up with a whole fleet of trucks, and like each truck is just completely stacked with ballot boxes, and each ballot box is just stuffed with a thousand votes. Ah yes, what a healthy democracy we have here. But maybe I just don't understand democracy. I mean, I thought that democracy came from the ancient Greek words demos and kratos, and basically translates to rule by the people. I mean, that's what Wikipedia and even fancy academic sources tell me. But I don't know, maybe they're all wrong. Maybe democracy really means rule by the wealthy, not rule by the people. Come to think of it, if you look at our democratic system of governance, that does sound about right. Wait, could it be that political democracy has been corrupted by capitalism? Nah, 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 nah. Everything's fine. This is fine. The thing is, even if all money was distributed equally, capitalism still would not be democratic because having choice over what products we consume does not give us choice over how those products are made. Like my laptop. Was my laptop made in a way that harms the environment? Yup. Were the workers subject to inhumane work conditions? Yes. Were the minerals and microchips extracted in a war zone? And did this provide funding for warlords? Maybe. 
All of this stuff isn't something that consumers have control over, and it's not something that workers have control over either. It's the people who own the means of production, the capitalists, who get to dictate how a product is made. And time after time, they decide that products should be made in a way that maximizes profit. Oh. <laughs> Shit. My shit is constantly falling off the walls. It symbolizes the collapse of our ecosystem. Just think of it that way. So that was very, that was intentional. Definitely an intentional thing that just happened there. And time after time, the capitalist class decides that products should be made in a way that maximizes profit, which is bad news for the environment, bad news for workers, bad news for people living in war zones, and pretty much bad news for anyone who's not a capitalist. But wait, cries a voice from the audience. If you think a company does bad, unethical things, then don't buy from that company. That's called voting with your dollar. Okay, well, for me, that's impossible because I think work in capitalism is inherently exploitative. So there won't be any company that meets my ethical standards. Now, you might think my standards are unreasonably high, but even if we lower our standards, being an ethical shopper or ethical consumer is still impossible. And to give you an idea of why this is the case, I'd like to play a clip of economist Milton Friedman. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, I haven't the slightest idea where it came from, or the yellow paint, or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. So even just a simple pencil has multiple companies involved in its production. I'd have to find out the names of all those companies. That alone would be difficult and time consuming. And then I'd have to research each company's business practices. Then do the same for the other pencils on the market and compare to find out which is best. Just to buy a pencil. Now imagine doing that for each and every purchase. That's thousands of companies. And even researching one company could take a very long time, since the information I seek is often not publicly available. Investigative journalists can take months or years to research a single company, but I'm supposed to do this for 25 companies just to buy a pencil? Come on, get real. Sometimes there are so-called fair trade options for some products or so-called environmentally friendly options, but there are a few problems with this. For starters, these options can only be considered better because the norm or the standard is so abysmally low. Let's take chocolate as an example. In cocoa production, slave labor, although not common practice, happens often enough to have earned the cocoa industry a reputation for slavery. And if you buy fair trade chocolate, then that means that the cocoa farmers won't be literal slaves. And that's a good thing. But it's not like non-enslaved farm workers have it good in capitalism. Some researchers who study fair trade have criticized it for failing to live up to the standards of fairness that it claims to achieve. And as for products that are marketed as eco-friendly, these often fall far short of being environmentally sustainable. And also, if you want to buy fair trade or eco-friendly products, they're more expensive, so have fun paying your anti-slavery penalty. I mean, if you don't want slavery, then you've got to pay the price. It's like extra toppings on pizza. It's a luxury. These entitled millennials and Zoomers, they expect the lack of slavery to just be handed to them. And on top of all this, the so-called fair trade or eco-friendly options, as flawed as they are, still only exist for a limited and small number of products, like chocolate or coffee. But where is the option to get a fair trade, eco-friendly laptop or phone? It doesn't exist, just like it doesn't exist for the vast majority of products on the market. 
All of the power is in the hands of the masses, at the hands of consumers. Is it though? What about the 821 million people who the United Nations says are undernourished due to chronic hunger? If the power is in their hands, then why are they starving? They don't even have the power to feed themselves. Nine million people die from hunger every year. They don't even have the power to keep themselves alive. Andy Puzder argues that socialism is selfish. So socialism is really based on greed. But if you ask me, it's pretty selfish for Andy, whose net worth is estimated at $25 million, to be defending a system like capitalism, where people like him have disproportionately extreme power to control economic resources, and therefore to buy mansions and luxury cars, and also to buy political power and media influence, and basically control everything, while others have so little power that they can't even meet their basic needs for food, housing, and medical care. Progressives argue that socialism is benevolent while capitalism is based on greed and avarice. Actually, it's just the opposite. In a capitalist economy, you can only succeed by meeting the needs of other people, your customers. Capitalism encourages you to meet the needs of other people. Capitalism is a very altruistic system. The way you succeed in a capitalist economy is by meeting others' needs, your consumers' needs. In fact, it's the only way you can survive. Your business will fail if you don't meet the needs of other people. Oh no, not this argument again. I already debunked it in the video just before this one. Well, fine, I guess I better respond again, but only a couple brief points and then we'll move on to new arguments. Although Andy claims that capitalism makes people's needs a priority, there is ample evidence that people's needs are ignored, neglected, and trampled upon for the sake of profit. And if you want an example of this evidence, just look up the scandal about the Boeing 737 MAX airplane crashes. 346 people died in these airplane crashes because the airplane company Boeing decided to cut back on costs by cutting back on safety to protect profits rather than protect lives. Making a safer airplane means making a more expensive airplane, which means less profit and Profit always comes first. Not exactly making people's needs a priority, are we, Andy? There are countless more examples of companies increasing their profits not by meeting people's needs, but by disregarding our needs. The results are usually less catastrophic than a plane crash, but they can also get a lot worse. Perhaps worst of all is the climate crisis. I can't think of any need more important than for a planet that can support human life. But capitalism has decided that no, what's more important is to support stockholder profit. But anyways, never mind that. Let's hear from Andy on why socialism is selfish. In a socialist society, you're focused on your own needs because you're competing with everybody else in society to get the most you can for yourself from the limited supply of goods, services, or benefits that the government makes available. I find it interesting that Andy says a limited supply of goods, as if to suggest that in capitalism, goods are unlimited? Any economic textbook tells you straight away that there is a limited supply of resources and that in capitalism, competition for those resources drives up prices. It seems Andy doesn't understand capitalism, and based on everything he says, he doesn't understand socialism either. But Understanding socialism will be a topic for another video. In a socialist society, whether you're in a food line or waiting for gas or medical care, you don't care what the people in front or behind you in that line get. You care about how you get the most for yourself. Wait, does he think this is unique to socialism? I mean, I've lived in capitalism my whole life, and I don't know about you, but when I'm in line at the store, I'm not thinking about the person in front or behind me. Oh wait, maybe that's because I'm a selfish socialist. You're not thinking about what other people need if you're standing in a line for food, bread, you know, government mandated healthcare. You're thinking about how much you can get for yourself. This is just such a weird thing to say. Does he think that in capitalism things are any different? That we're all just standing there in line at the grocery store thinking about the needs of all the other people in line with us? Who does that? Andy also mentions being in line for healthcare. Now, this is a situation where I'd be thinking about the other people waiting with me because everyone around me is sick or injured. So obviously I'm gonna feel concerned for them. 
But my caring about these people has nothing to do with whether the healthcare is free or whether it costs money. Why on earth would it? Andy, it makes no sense. Although, if the healthcare does cost money, I actually would be more concerned. Not because I would care more, but because for every person I see, I'll be wondering, what if this person can't afford treatment? What if they have to go into massive debt? What if they lose their home? What if they're turned away? Are they gonna die because of that? And come to think of it, at the grocery store, maybe we should be thinking about the people in line with us. Because thanks to capitalism, hundreds of millions of people are starving. And one of those people might be next to us in line. So in a sick, twisted way, he's right. Capitalism will make me more concerned about people, but only because capitalism is such a horrendous nightmare. We did it, guys. In order to move beyond capitalism, it's important to know that the working class has a key role to play in making this happen. The capitalist class depends on workers to make profit, and capitalism depends on workers to function. By organizing, we can build the power to uproot capitalism and create a libertarian socialist society that will benefit not just the working class, but all humanity. I'll address this in depth in future videos, but in the meantime you can check out my video on organizing that takes a brief look at the issue, and you can also look into the IWW, or Industrial Workers of the World, and if there's a branch near you, consider joining. So in conclusion, well, I'll just let Andy have the last word. Socialism is benevolent, while capitalism is based on greed and avarice. Oh. Hello there. I haven't seen you in like three, maybe even four seconds. Ugh, oh, hasn't it just been terrible being apart like this? But alas, it is time for us to part once again, because that's the end of the video. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, share the video, do all the things. Thank you so much for watching, and now, a word from our sponsors. I wrote a little song for you, it goes something like this. To all my comrades in the world, I'd like to give you a kiss. Mwah, mwah.